Hey, good morning and welcome to our March United Way Investors Call. Uh, my name is Michael Williamson. I'm the President and CEO of United Way of Southeast Louisiana. I want to thank all of our donors, advocates, and volunteers that have, that have joined us today. Um, as most of you know, we fight for the education, health, and economic opportunity of every person in every community that we serve, and we have a bold new vision to eradicate poverty. With, with your generous support, we've been able to make you know, great progress uh, towards. And so today, as one of our calls, we'd like to give you an update on how we're putting your contributions to work. And so um, throughout the call, um, we're going to share some great news with you. And once again, want to reinforce that this is work that we're doing because of your generous support of our United Way and, and the agenda that we have to in poverty throughout the region. Let me start with um, uh, uh, just referencing, you know, we're in the official 2018 legislative session as a part of our work to end poverty once again on your behalf. Um, we have our chief operating officer and lobbyist, uh, Charmaine Cassiope, who spends every waking moment in Baton Rouge uh, fighting for the agenda that our board has approved with your support. And so just to give you a rough rundown of what our focus is for this particular legislative session, in the area of education, we're focused on the child care assistance program to make sure we maintain current funding for that program. In the area of financial security, we're focused on supporting and maintaining the earned income tax credit, which has proven over time to be one of the most effective tools um, to eradicate poverty. And so we're proud to be doing that work on your behalf. We continue to pay attention to the minimum wage uh, debate and continue to monitor uh, work around that, uh, that issue. Also on behalf of so many throughout our state, continue to monitor issues around pay equity, in particular pay secrecy. Um, and also we're monitoring to work around you know, issues related to predatory payday lending. And so for, for many of you know that work for to address issues facing Alice, those are at the limited income constrained yet employed. And one major barrier is when folks fall on tough times, they end up having to look for uh, financial resources and often turn to predatory payday uh, lenders. Um, in the area of health, uh, domestic violence continues to be a focus of ours, and there are several issues around firearm, re firearm relinquishment, the line trial background check enforcement and notification, and crimes of violence. We continue to also work with our partners to address ways to end sexual, sexual harassment in the workplace, and also are focused on issues around human trafficking and Medicaid work requirements. And last but not least, and as I turn it over to our chairman, Rick Haas, uh, we continue to look and support efforts around justice reinvestment, as well as Louisiana's foster care system. And so with all that said, we're proud to be doing this work on your behalf and with your support. And as the legislative session, begin, legislative session begins, I uh, know that we're doing everything we can um, for these and address these issues. And now I'd like to turn it over to our chairman of the board, Mr. Rick. Thank you, Michael. Uh, let me just do a quick check. We're having some problems this morning getting on. Can you hear me well? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, all right. Well, good. Uh, thank you for being on the call, everybody. We're pretty excited about the work that's being done. And thanks to the uh, support and many hours and, 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 of course, financial support that you all have consistently made sure that we, we received. We're able, to, we're, we're able to intervene in a whole whole lot of areas and change the lives of people and change the trajectory of those lives and and really improve some outcomes so this past couple of weeks michael i think i i want to just bring everybody up to date on the work that we're doing regarding um the last point that you brought up the um cr uh, criminal justice reform and and in particular prisoner reentry. everybody knows that uh, louisiana has a significant crime and we've heard statistics quite a bit um, over the last decade about how Louisiana incarcerates more people on a per capita basis than any other state in the, in, in the uh, nation. And, and that's not a proud statistic. That's something that's both problematic socially, but it's problematic financially because in order to, in order to keep someone behind bars, it costs uh, an enormous amount of, of money. As a matter of fact, um, it, it, the, uh, 
when you when you think about what it takes to to um, put somebody behind bars and feed them and clothe them and supervise them and keep them in that environment and then healthcare needs it is it's so expensive that as these as the incarceration rates increase it puts greater and greater pressure on the state's finances and and so a particularly alarming statistic, and as a, a credit to um, UWA for the last many years, we've been working to help try to intervene in the the problem of what's what's called recidivism, the rate at which criminals re-enter jail. And so, I, I just want to I, I just want to share this number because it, it's it's jaw dropping that almost very, very close to 50%, one out of two men and women who leave incarceration, who get out of jail, within 36 months are back behind bars. And the reason for that has a great deal to do with the fact that they don't have um, the ability to, to um, they don't have the ability, the knowledge, the understanding, the training to stay out of jail, to stop doing the things that they, that put them there. And uh, as a result, this uh, this parade of incarceration, this parade leading to the doors of the jail cell continues. So one of the wonderful things about United Way, and be, again, because of your support, we're able to do is start to develop programming that's really going to be in fact impactful to lower the recidivism rate. That 50%, one out of two number, is before any metrics or any numbers get put into place on the early release program. That's where we release people back into society before the full term of their sentence. So we've been working hard over the last several several weeks, especially uh, working with the, uh, the uh, Reinvestment Act to help create the programming, not only to create the programming through our partners, but also work to oversee the process for the effective use of taxpayer dollars in this way. And um, couldn't do it without you. And I, I know that we're, we see some light at the end of the tunnel. We at uh, Metropolitan Crime Commission, at New Orleans Police and Justice Foundation, on which I, on whose boards on which I serve, um, we see the effects of the justice system. We see the needs and, and whether they're being met or not. But at United Way, we're really at the root cause of that that circumstance. We're really trying to intervene in the lives of people early, early on to stop them from getting on that um, that conveyor belt that leads them to a life of uh, imprisonment. Um, so, Michael, I, I, you know, I don't, I don't know if I don't want to get too much farther into the detail, but just to say um, thank you to everybody on the call on behalf of the board. Thank you for all the support, because whether it's early childhood intervention, care, and education. Um, or teaching people how to read, teaching these youngsters how to read so that they have an opportunity for greater economic success. And it ties directly to the blueprint for prosperity for our mission to eradicate poverty, because we certainly can't keep going in the direction we're going. And um, it's, it's just been a great eye-opening and also exciting um, last month or two as we work to try to solve this one particular problem. Thanks to everybody on the call on behalf of the board. Michael, I'm back to you. Uh, thank you, Rick, and thanks for your leadership. And as well, once again, to all of our donors, advocates, and volunteers, this this is the work that we do because of your generous support. And this is just one great example of how we're trying to make an impact when it comes to criminal justice, justice reform, and reentry. So now I'd like to turn it over to our chief impact officer, Ms. Mary Ambrose, to give you an update on how we're using your resources in the community impact area. Well, good morning. I'm so excited to be on today because uh, Rick just hit on my topic as well, the Louisiana Prisoner Reentry and the Ready for Work Initiative. We know that returning citizens face many barriers to being productive, contributing citizens, and they come out and they're faced with employment, trying to find employment, housing, transportation, mental health, substance abuse treatment. And so our Ready for Work initiative is really focused on how do we address the workforce barriers uh, through a $25,000 planning grant from the Greater New Orleans Foundation. New Orleans Works Collaborative, we have been able to hire a consultant from the National Hire Network to 
guide us in the development of the Ready for Work program design. So we're at the table. Uh, HIRE stands for Helping Individuals with Criminal Records Reenter Through Employment. And the model is really employer-driven, it's evidence-based, it's integrated service delivery. Um, so I just kind of want to unpack that a little bit. So the model calls for connecting employers um, to returning citizens and helping employers to prepare and educating them to hire returning citizens and identifying the supports that potential employers would need including financial employment incentive, incentives such as federal bonding programs, the work opportunity tax credit, and welfare to work. It also prepares prisoners prior to release for employment, so preparing them uh, for the soft skills, work habits, job training, and any other identified needs, including mental health services. Uh, we're ensuring that returning citizens have the necessary resources in place because we know that they're going to need resources when they come out. Uh, and also working with employers and returning citizens upon release and utilizing community members and community-based services as intermediaries between employers and job-seeking individuals. So our table consists of uh, our workforce partners. We're at the planning table. We have the Louisiana Association of Business and Industry, our other workforce partner, uh, New Orleans Business Alliance, the Network for Economic Opportunity, and two of the five opportunity centers, Strive and Job One. And we also have the city's new program, uh, Project Restart. And then the United Way, J. Wayne Leonard Prosperity Center. We're all at the table. We're planning for how this um, Ready for Work initiative will look. We're uh, really wanting to hear from employers about, you know, what's the barriers to hiring uh, returning citizens? How can we address those barriers? We have assessed the assets in our community. We have a lot of assets in this community. Uh, however, we need to bring them together. We've looked at the gaps in services, but again, we're back to the employers. We need you at the table with us, helping us to plan, helping us to, to figure this out, and what could we do uh, to better help you to employ, uh, employ returning citizens. We have a planning session, which uh, it's scheduled for April 13th with employers, and we'd like to invite everyone that is on this call to attend. Uh, if you are an employer, please come and join us. You can reach out to me at 504-827-6859 or email me at maria at unitedwaysela.org if you'd like to attend, and we'll get you that information. The next thing I want to talk about Mary, is our Mary. Mary, it's Rick again. I I think uh, one of the things that I failed to mention that you're you're talking about. I, I think the callers would be interested to know that at in the, in Louisiana, about 1,500 inmates are released every single month. Every single month, 1,500 inmates. In November of last year, an additional 1,900 um, uh, prisoners were released back into the community in one month at an early release program. So what you're talking about is really helping them with that cadre of services, is helping them be released, not on a street corner somewhere, but on a, on some solid foundations with all of the things that they need to be to have the real opportunity to not just end up back in jail. Thank you for doing the work. Thank you for making sure that that's happening. Thank you, Rick, and absolutely. We wanna make sure that we start uh, the great thing about the ready for work model is you start while they're in prison versus waiting till they're out on the street. And so we're able to address uh, those prisoners' needs, but the employer needs and prepare people and, and be able to be that intermediary uh, to help them be successful because that's what we want. We want them to come back into this community and be productive, contributing citizens. Um, so I'm gonna move on to our next uh, item is the Emergency Food and Shelter Program. This is a program that United Way has been doing for 34 years, and I think uh, we don't really talk about it that much. 
but it's addressing the basic emergency needs of vulnerable citizens and some which may be returning citizens. So just a little background on this program. The EFSP program was established in 1983 with the signing of the Job Stimulus Bill. That legislation created a national board chaired by FEMA uh, that consists of representatives of the American Red Cross, Catholic Charities USA, the Jewish Federation of North America, National Council of Churches of Christ in the U.S., and then the Salvation Army and United Way Worldwide. So each jurisdiction or parish, county, has a local board that has the same makeup, and in addition, there's a homeless person or a formerly homeless person that's sitting on this local board directing the activities. United Way Sealer serves as the administrator of the program and the local board which reports to the national board uh, uh, are responsible for directing and administering those funds that come through the national board. Since 1983, the EFSP program will have distributed $4.4 billion to over 1,400 human service agencies in more than 2,500 communities. The program addresses the non-disaster related emergencies individuals and families face every day, so like our Alice families. With special emphasis on identification and assistance to the elderly families, uh, to the elderly families with children, Native Americans, veterans, and homeless. Funding to a jurisdic jurisdiction is based on the unemployment rate of each community. However, for us, United Way SILA uh, administers the program for Orleans, Jefferson, St. Tammany, St. Bernard, and Plaquemines Parish. Currently, only Orleans Parish is receiving funding, and that's based on the unemployment rate here. Tangipoa and Washington Parish have their own local board and distribute the funds through their local board. Funding is granted out in phases, and currently we are completing phase 34, which ended January 31st. Phase 34, $198,635 was allocated to 12 organizations that provide emergency housing, shelter, utilities, and food. Organizations are in the process of submitting their final reports and documentation so we can close out phase 33 and 34, and they're due to the National Board on April 9th. All agencies must submit their final report and have no compliance issues, so they're able to apply for phase 35. Each year, the funding for EFSP is approved by Congress, and we're waiting on their approval for phase 35 funding, and we'll advertise that availability of these funds as soon as we are notified. So the next thing I wanna talk about is our United Way Worldwide Equity Work. I'm really super excited to report that we wrote and received a grant of $20,000 from Toyota through the United Way Worldwide to help us get started on our equity work. We are one of 12 United Ways across the country working on this equity issue. If you remember when our blueprint was approved with a vision of equitable communities where all individuals are healthy, educated, and economically stable, it was also approved that it would be viewed through a lens of equity, racism, and families. However, the blueprint likes those indicators that will allow United Way to assess equity within a funded organization or a collaborative. So to fully realize the potential of the, the blueprint's impact, we must create specific equity indicators around the work. And our goal is to have the equity indicators identified for the 2019 program grant cycle. The great thing about this grant is that it also allows United Way SILA to assess its own internal practices so that we're better positioned to hold our partners accountable. We have hired a consultant, many of you may know, Dr. Toya Bourne Teamer from HCM Strategies, who is already at work setting up meetings with our staff. We have meetings planned with our partners as well as our board. Surveys are also being developed. So if you receive a survey, please respond to the survey. You're, your uh, input is so valuable to us, and she will be compiling all of this information and submitting a report to United Way SILA, 
with action steps at the end of August. So thank you so much and look out for those surveys. Uh, thanks, Mary, and great examples of how we're leveraging your generosity. And here's another example. I'd like to turn it over to our Senior Vice President of Long-Term Recovery, Jameen Dahmer. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Michael and Rick, for giving me the opportunity to give you a quick update on how we've been investing the funds that people have very generously given to the United Way for our flood recovery. So it's three short months before we actually enter hurricane season for this year. So we're very busy as we speak, trying to make sure that we get everything we have ready um, so that we can create some opportunities to send some information out to our partners and our um, donors to make sure that they are aware and ready of what's coming up and how they can, can get ready for uh, hurricane season. However, while we're doing that, we are still working on our families and individuals that are needing assistance from the floods that happened in 2016. I'm very happy to report we just completed a 18-month uh, um, update on where we've invested our funds. I'm really happy to say that United Way has invested in over 155 families where we had some unmet needs of these families out in the community, and that can include things like and the majority of it is where we have rebuilt uh, families' homes or made sure that we've been able to get them in some type of permanent housing situation. That's 155 families, 60, um, 68 of which were immediately following the storm from August to December of 2016, and another 87 families in 2017. But as we move through these short few months of 2018, we're already working with 25 families. And we have um, been very lucky that we've had some great partners in our rebuild work. We've uh, been partnering with the Red Cross. We received word from the Red Cross that they will uh, shortly be sending us $300,000, just over $300,000 to invest with these families that we're working with through June of 2018. So we will be utilizing those funds that are in partnership with the Red Cross to house um, we're hoping another 40 or 50 families throughout this year. I wanted to talk this um, month about some of the real life stories. I think I've shared in the past a few stories, but just this past week we've had some success stories that I'm really happy to share. For instance, our Alice client, a single mother with children, works a full-time minimum wage job, and even though she has such a small income, in her mobile home that she lived, she made sure that she was covering flood insurance so that if anything had ever happened to her mobile home. Her insurance did pay off. She received two foot of water. And in a mobile home, we know that that typically can decimate the, the possibility of having any repair done in the home when you have two foot of water coming inside a mobile home. She did receive insurance. However, the mortgage company um, took the insurance money to pay off the mortgage, leaving her unable to do any type of repairs on her home. So because of your investments, this Alice client, this single mother with children, was able to work with the United Way, with the Red Cross, and another partnership with UMCOR. And through the three of us, and, and in conjunction as well with the state of Louisiana's Restore program, we're, as we speak this afternoon, a new mobile home unit We'll be driving into the property where she lives, and those children and our Alice client will no longer be homeless. Those are the success stories of why the investment in long-term recovery and having um, the program that we have is so important. Because without that, um, we wouldn't have the capacity to bring these people back to a safe, sanitary, and secure lifestyle. And one more story before we end it, as we know that we've worked with those um, 155 families, we have a 55-year-old. Um, disabled female trees fell actually in her home, totally opening the roof line, receiving numerous sheets of water, uh, put water throughout her home, allowing mold to grow throughout the entire home. It was deemed unlivable and, and could not be repaired. And again, another success story where through partnerships together with our United Way, working with Restore Louisiana and the state program, as well as the Red Cross and UMCOR, we're able to bring this family, this disabled female, back to a safe, sanitary, secure living situation where we were able to provide a new mobile home unit for her to put on her property. So I'm really happy to say that your investments that you're making in United Way are making a difference. Um, we, we are doing everything we can to keep this going. We have about 250 more cases that we have 
um, that we're working with our case managers on. So we'll continue the good work um, on your behalf and the investor's behalf, Michael. Uh, thanks. Wait, wait. Uh, uh, Michael, let me let me just jump in real quick. All for being here. I'm going to jump off the call. Um, but, uh, you know, one of the interesting things over the last month that uh, I got to see, and I want to tell the, the people on our on our call today, Jameen, you literally invented processes to make this long-term recovery happen. And I'm absolutely blown away by the fact that you, you know, United Way has been there since the waters rose, since the, since the waters receded. And it's over a year and a half since that flood took place and the emergency moments are gone. But now the long term recovery that takes real commitment. Uh, it's not in the news anymore, but you're out there, Jamine, every day making it work. And one of the most impressive parts of the work that you're doing is holding our donors money in trust and making sure that not only do you get the money where it needs to go, but you police it and, and use that use the contributions that we have to leverage additional donations so that our money can go farther. That That is such a, you literally hold that money and this process in trust for the people who have given so generously. So thank you for doing that. And for those of you who have given to the flood effort, you'd be very, very proud of the uh, work uh, that, w that Jamin and United Way of Southeast Louisiana has done in safeguarding that money to make sure it really gets leveraged and lands on the right, right targets. So thank you so much. Thank Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Rick. Um, now I'd like to turn it over to Lee Thorpe, Senior Vice President of Resource Development Marketing. Well, I thank you all so much um, for joining the call. And as, as um, Rick mentioned, and Mary and Jameen, the work we uh, we do can't be done without the donors that we have. And as we're marching to the finish, our campaign closes on March 31st. So we're trying to secure every dollar possible to make sure this work continues year after year. Um, it's, it's more valuable now um, more than ever. And so we really hope if you have not yet given a gift to United Way this year, that we hope you'll do so through visiting our website. Uh, UnitedWaySeela.org before March 31st so we can get every dollar necessary. Um, lastly, we'll, we'll um, take over um, our Senior Director of Investor Relations. We'll talk about some great work that our Women United group is doing. Great. Well, thank you, guys. Um, on March 26th, we are having our Women United Day at the Capitol, and we are very excited to be partnering with four other United Ways across the state. At this point, we have over 45 women who will be joining us on this day to advocate for early childhood education among many other issues, some of um, which Michael actually mentioned earlier in the call, um, that really affect women and children in our community. So we really look forward to a great day at the Capitol as our members um, are able to use their voices to implement change in our communities. With that, I will turn it back over to Michael. So uh, thanks to everybody once again for joining our uh, March investor calls. Um, as you can see, a lot of great work has taken place thanks to your, your generosity and we'll continue to fight for the education, health, and economic opportunity for every person in every community we serve. Of course, you can always visit our website to learn more about the great work at the least point. If you haven't made your contribution yet, you can do that via our website at unitedwaystila.org. And we always have great information on social media. Just look for the handle at UnitedWaystila. And as always, we encourage you to give, advocate, volunteer and connect with us. I thank you again for all your support and we look forward to hearing from you again soon.